Welcome back. This is James Corbett of CorbettReport.com, and you are tuned into the BoilingFrogsPost.com eye-opener report for this week, where we are joined on the line once again for an exclusive interview by BoilingFrogsPost.com founder and editor Sibel Edmonds. And today we're going to be talking about a new article that she has posted up on BoilingFrogsPost.com that's garnering quite a bit of attention. It's under the headline, Turkish PM Erdogan, The Speedy Transformation of an Imperial Puppet. And as the title might indicate, it goes through the very interesting interesting fall from grace of this former globalist insider uh, golden boy who is now very much on the outside um, and is facing some difficulties both within and without um, from his uh, his people and from people around the world so let's take a look at this article and and get our uh, roll up our sleeves and take a look at some of the facts going on here so Sabelle great to have you here why don't you just tell us a little bit about this article and what prompted you to start writing it well, as you know, James, I have been following the politics, Turkish politics, very, very closely for many, many years, for over a decade. Uh, I used to live in Turkey, and my case with the FBI, my entire whistleblowing had to do with the U.S.-Turkish operations that, uh, that became the state secrets privilege. And uh, on the other hand, I have tried to stay away in terms of writing uh, and being public about the Turkey's uh, own internal politics for several reasons. Uh, one main reason uh, had to do with a lot of attacks that I endured <laughs> about 10 years ago because it was interesting. I was, a, I was an outcast here in the United States. Uh, this is the government who thought I was betraying the U.S. government's operations. But because of the media in Turkey, they also reflect, you know, kind of uh, portrayed me in Turkey as a, as a person who is betraying Turkey and is working against Turkey or worked against Turkey. So I said, I'm going to set it aside and I'm just going to focus on a lot of issues that we are covering here. But of course, as you know, with our Gladio series, with the many, many articles I have written, uh, I have been dealing with a lot of uh, issues and cases that have many Turkish angles in them, including the uh, infamous Imam Fethullah Gulen and his network here in the United States, uh, in Central Asia and Caucasus, and also in Turkey. Well, I'm, I have to add this. <laughs> About a couple of days ago, via Twitter, I received many requests from uh, ordinary Turkish people who were asking for my opinion about, well, what is your take on what's happening with uh, Prime Minister Erdogan? Where do you stand on this? Would you please provide us with some analysis? And uh, I think that kind of gave me the needed push to sit down and put together this first analysis pieces that ended up being really long. But in order to do it justice, I had to include a lot of history and context and the chronology of what has been taking place. And hopefully it is informative. Uh, I don't think Turkish people need that that much because they are right in the tick of it. But uh, it's mainly for the U.S. audience to see how we go about these uh, play, this game of regime change and regime installment, which I call it the re reverse engineering. <laughs> you know, we, we build puppets and we build them up. And when their time comes, I call it the expiration date, that's when we bring them down. And it's almost like an overnight process that is amazing, amazing to, to see and to put together. So when they are in one place, people can observe and say, wow, how could somebody go from angel to evildoer, you know, and, and how the U.S. media, a lot of global mainstream media are uh, acting as the branch of the establishment, the powers to make this possible, to be able to shape the views on, you know, this person was an angel and now he's a terrorist, he's a he's an evil, he's a dictator, he's a despot. And for people to pause and say, how, how does this occur, this whole process? Well, I think your article does a great job of pointing out that transformation that's taken place. And of course, the uh, I think the iconic image in most people and most Americans' minds would probably be Donald Rumsfeld's golden handshake to uh, Saddam Hussein back in the 1980s, and then the invasion that came a little bit later when he fell out of favor. So we are seeing a similar transformation happening with Erdogan, who has been called by Obama, as you point out in your article, uh, one of the top five partners of, of the U.S. around the globe or whatever um, rhetoric he was using at the time. And of course, that has definitely changed changed in recent months 
especially. And I think a lot of uh, even casual observers of what's happening in Turkey will know what happened with the, the Gezi Park protests. But of course, this is part of a much broader agenda, as you point out in your article, and you do tie it back to Fethullah Gulen's network, which for listeners out there who don't remember, we did talk about Fethullah Gulen at some length in our Gladio B series. So I will, as always, once again, invite you to go and re-watch or watch for the first time that series if you haven't watched it before. But let's start tying this together. What exactly, uh, why is this transformation taking place and who is behind it? Uh, sure. Uh, the answer is multi-parted. As always, we don't have usually a linear, simple answer, but the fall of Erdogan, if we start uh, viewing it as such, as this fall from the grace in the eyes of the Western powers, especially the CIA, uh, started with a rift between Erdogan and, and Gulen. Fethullah Gulen's network, this, uh, the, the imam, they played a major role in bringing this party into power in shaping the views and starting the movement. And, uh, and the current uh, administration, uh, um, Erdogan's and Gül's, their administration came into power with the full support and backing of Gülen. And I have to distinguish when I say Gülen, you know, Gülen is just a symbol. I mean, currently he's a man who has lost most of his mental faculty. You know, he's being considered as senile. They are kind of hiding him. But his name, his brand, is a brand. It's a brand that was really promoted and established by the CIA after 1997, once Fethullah Gulen, this mullah, this imam, was brought into the United States. He wanted to overthrow the Turkey's uh, secular government, and uh, he was wanted in Turkey. So they brought him here, and they actually initially settled him near Langley, <laughs> Virginia, and they basically groomed him and let him uh, set up a network. And this was the uh, people within the networks are all the CIA people. And people can look into it. It's very easy to find out all the names from CIA's Graham Fuller to Abramowitz. And he got settled. And today in the United States, he's been living here for 15 years. His network is around 20 to $25 billion worth, okay? Nobody knows where his money comes from. He has established charter schools in the United States. Well, outside the United States, since 1998, Gulen's branch have, together with the CIA, have set up over 350 mosques all over Central Asia and Caucasus and madrasas. These are, uh, you know, the madrasas, the Islamic religious schools, and they ended up getting kicked out of a lot of these countries because the, the regimes there, they realized that this was a propaganda and actually operations under the CIA to uh, basically Islamicize these former Soviet Union states. But they remained very strong in other uh, former Soviet Union states such as uh, Azerbaijan. But of course, in Turkey also, he started building an empire network. And that was by, by, by pouring money and establishing network within Turkish media. And he slowly began to take over the Turkish media, the influential arms of Turkish media. He started actually planting people within the Turkish military and Turkish police forces. So his network has been very, very active. And the same network brought into power Erdogan by promoting Erdogan strongly. Because Erdogan's political party... Fairness Square won in 1997, you know, they were elected by, by, by the people. But at that point, this was during Gladio A, the switch had not taken place completely. Turkish military, with the backing of the United States, they came and they banned the party. They put Erdogan in jail. They put other party members in jail. They said, look, in Turkey, votes don't count. We don't approve of him. So even if you gather 45 million votes for him, we're not going to let him come into power. Well, that entire situation changed. In 2002, the party got elected again, but this time the military had to stay silent and step aside and let them actually come into power. So what took place between 1997 and 2002? Well, what took place was Gladio B, Fethullah Gulen coming to U.S., and the strategy changing to this plan B. So they were very close. But what happens is when you are popular among the public as a political leader, and in this case it's, it is Erdogan, 
you it comes with a little bit of confidence increase and you become a little bit uh, given to some hubris. You say, you know what? I am very popular. People love me. Look at the polls, okay? So I don't have to bow to this to this imam all the time. There are things that I want to do whether or not he agrees or not. So he started getting a little bit overconfident that he is popular and in fact he doesn't have to bow so much to, to Gulen. So that's one, one element that began taking place about a few years ago. Then came Erdogan's very strong position on Israel <laughs> and he became kind of really tough. I mean, he talked the talk, a little bit walked the walk and guess what? Of all the powers, of all the parties in Turkey, all the influence, the first criticism for his uh, being tough and brave on Israel issue came from Fethullah Gulen. Fethullah Gulen publicly condemned Erdogan's strong statements against Israel. And, uh, and by the way, to, as a side note, Fethullah Gulen's biggest promoters outside the CIA here in the United States has been the Israel lobby. And again, people can actually Google Fethullah Gulen, Gulen movement, and put Israel lobby, whether it's APAC, whether it is through ATC, and they will see that Gulen has been enjoying a very powerful backing of the Israel lobby. I mean, you're looking at an Islamic mullah, this imam, and you're looking at Israel lobby backing him. That itself should raise the questions for people. So Fethullah Gulen said, yeah, 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 this is not what we do here. So you better shut up and stop criticizing Israel, okay? I don't approve of it. So that was number two. So the rift began becoming wider and, and the separation became wider. Then, of course, we had the issue of Syria, and that's uh, number three. As uh, we know, we broke the story of Turkey and the camps within Turkey actually training and arming and sending the rebels from, you know, the, Israel, the Syrian rebels back into Syria. And this was all orchestrated by the United States. A lot of these trainings, a lot of these arming took place through the Injilik base. This is the U.S. air base in Turkey, fully supported, not only supported, it was ordered by the United States. Under the order of the United States, the Turkish government began preparing these rebels to go and oust Assad. And things were going fine as far as U.S. and, and Turkey doing this. But then, of course, unexpected developments started uh, taking place. One, we had the the idea becoming unpopular here in the United States. So Obama didn't have the support of the popular uh, view here in the United States. Then we had Russia stepping in. So U.S. quickly backtracked and said, okay, we're not going to go with that plan with ousting Assad a la Libya. It's not going to work. What we did in Libya is not going to work because we have other elements in place and it's not the idea, the notion is not popular here in the United States. When that happened, well, this whole notion was extremely unpopular in Turkey. When Erdogan, the Turkish military and Turkish government, they started implementing the United States order on opposing Assad, on, on arming and training the rebels, well, Turkish people hated that. Because Turkey has had a pretty good relationship with Assad and Syria. It's another Muslim country, okay? It's a neighbor Muslim country. So that idea to begin with was very unpopular. So with U.S. backtracking and Turkey being exposed as the training grounds for uh, anti-Assad, well, Erdogan ended up standing alone <laughs> and it was like, what happened here? Because the United States guaranteed that this was going to be fair and quick, just like the way we did it with Libya. Now I'm unpopular with my own people. A lot of people are getting pissed. They have gotten pissed with what I have done. And I don't have the backing of the United States for what we were doing. So I'm the one who has to eat the crow here. So that really, really, really angered Erdogan in that. So that's number three elements. So with him becoming a little bit more unpopular with the public, with his Syria position, unpopular with Gulen and the rift getting wider and becoming a bigger rift between the two, we had those Gezi Park, which started with this park, which was not a huge, ginormous issue. 
And you had the environmentalists in Turkey, rightfully so, standing up and, and, and protesting. Well, Fethullah Gülen seized upon this opportunity. So he took a real, a real protest, that was the people's protest, with his network, and he started bringing in his network and his people. And of course, Erdogan saw what was happening, and he actually started speaking up on this issue, saying, I am seeing foreign elements, I'm seeing outside elements actually guiding and, and uh, provoking people in this case. And then, of course, when you come down the road, then in the past six to nine months, this protest, again, being hijacked to a large degree by Gulen, which when I say Gulen, is a CIA-backed Gulen, and it is not basically the pure people protesting against Erdogan, which again, we see it over and over. We have been seeing it in Egypt. We have been seeing elsewhere in the world. When you have people expressing you know, their, their, their uh, discontent, their unhappiness, and they stand up for their rights and they protest, you get the outside power saying, let's, let's use this for our own goals and objectives. And that's exactly what we have been seeing with, uh, with Erdogan. And number five elements is, of course, as we have illustrated in this article, suddenly the U.S. media, the world media, you know, in the United Kingdom, here in the United States, they started pairing those very famous and infamous adjectives with, um, with, er with Erdogan, dictator despot, corrupt, you know, and in fact, another very interesting uh, thing is a very, very old news from 2002-2004 on Al-Qaeda, Yasin Al-Qaeda, which has been known for over 10 years, and then suddenly, and in fact, it was covered up by the U.S. media when we were trying to expose it, and now they're even bringing back those ties. Guess what? Prime Minister Erdogan is very intimately tied with Al-Qaeda financiers, al qaeda So again, it is part of the modus operandi we have been seeing so much with the media, the mainstream media being part of it, and of course being orchestrated by the CIA and the establishment, and that's where we are right now with Erdogan. Well, that paints a very vivid picture, and I think that does cover a lot of the different angles there, but I'm still a little bit unclear then uh, if this falling out between Erdogan and Gulen is really ultimately a falling out between Erdogan and the CIA. What is the CIA's stake in this? What are they hoping to achieve in Turkey, and what are they hoping to, to replace Erdogan with? Well, what it was initially with letting Erdogan and, and AKP coming into power was they were the symbolic portion of the power. So you have the symbolic people. It's no different than what we see anywhere in the world, including here in the United States. It's like Obama. I mean, it's not about Obama. It's not about Obama's ideas. This is not about Obama's wars or George Bush's. It is the establishment behind Obama and the establishment behind uh, uh, George W. Bush. You know, yeah, and it is the CIA. It is the military industrial complex. Well, they had their, their puppet there, okay, knowing fully that the power behind it was them, meaning through Fethullah Gülen, that they were going to implement policies, they were going to set the foreign policy agenda. So that was, to, to begin with, the, the notion, and it worked. That's why he was very popular. Uh, Turkish government, this was advertised as the model of democracy for the rest of the Middle East. This is what the United States wants and wanted for Egypt, for Libya, for Syria, instead of Assad, they want to have these puppet regimes, what they tag as moderate Islam, and put them in place. Well, the rift between Erdogan and Gulen actually gets in the way, because through Gulen's network, which Erdogan knows very well, that is CIA's network, this was going to be basically their way, their channel being, being channeled through AKP and implemented. So... Number one, they saw that rift and seeing that they are losing control of one of their boys. It's not the case with the president. They have no problem with Gül. Gül has been a good butler. He's been serving, you know, Gülen's, uh, all Gülen's networks, you know, uh, agenda setting, etc. But not with Erdogan. Then Erdogan further pissed off the powers. Because when this started taking place, Erdogan said, you know something? I am going to stand up. Okay, 
I am going to now, for maybe the first time, watch out for Turkey's interest. That huge order we were going to place with you, $2 billion worth or $5 billion worth for these weapons, I'm not going to purchase it from you and your companies being United States. I'm going to buy that from China. This is violating one of the top commandment of United States and NATO empire. You don't do that. A NATO ally is purchasing their weapons, military weapons from China. And of course, we saw a lot of screaming. So he ended up pissing off the United States military industrial complex and NATO. Further, he stood up even further and said, you know something? We are tired of this. For the past 25 years, 30 years, we've been trying to enter EU. And, you know, you're not doing it. And we are tired of this game. In fact, we want to align ourselves with SEO, you know, the Shanghai Corporation. And they actually put forward their request for candidacy. Again, that's another commandment being violated. So you're looking at some a puppet that decided to rebel against the puppet masters. And... When you do that, I don't care if you are Mubarak or in Egypt or if you are in Turkey, that is when the expiration date stamp gets placed on you. First of all, they have to make an example of him. What happens if you start having Romania or some of the other countries in the Middle East that are under our power saying, well, Erdogan did it. Didn't you say he's a model democracy? We are going to say, well, you know what? This, this country is providing a better price and a more reasonable, and I'm going to purchase our military equipment from them, or from Russia, or from China. This cannot, they would not let this happen. So they have to make an example of, of Erdogan. And for Erdogan too, they have made examples of other people for Erdogan to see. I mean, for Erdogan right now, they are saying, and this is behind the scenes, we are not going to hear this right now. They are saying, A, you can back off, bow, repent, okay, take back everything, you know, start kissing Israel's butt, and you're not ordering from China, you back off from this SEO, start apologizing and kissing uh, Imam Gulen's feet, you know, the networks, we let you stay. So that's your option one. Option number two, you can quietly resign and go away, because we already have your replacement thought out, because this is all planned. And so that's your option to, you know, all Turkish presidents, all Turkish politicians are corrupt. You know, he is no more corrupt than the rest of them before him. So he has accumulated tens of millions of dollars. So he can settle in the United Kingdom. That's where everybody goes, England. <laughs> or he can come to the United. That's your option to quietly go. Number three, you can wait for us to take you out. And in that case, two scenarios can happen. You can go a la Saddam and Gaddafi. We can sodomize you right there in Taksim Square where Gezi Park happened and kill you. Okay. Okay. And that is if you want to spill the beans because Erdogan may. Now they are, well, Erdogan has to watch out for his own life too. But the whole thing is if he ha if he's not a coward, he's going to spill beans of how this has been operating, how the powers have been actually taking over. So if you do that, you're going to go a la Gaddafi and you're going to go a la Saddam Hussein. Or you can be a coward like Mubarak because Mubarak could have spilled so many beans too. We let you live. You know, you will be in some prison. Then maybe your health will go bad. And again, we'll take you to the United Kingdom. <laughs> That's where you end up. Well, uh, what I'm trying to tell you is the scenario is so identical that it almost makes it, in, in a way, boring of, of how we implement. This is how we operate. And this is the situation Erdogan is today. And these are the options he has. Now, whether or not he's going to bow or he's going to get tough, we are going to see it in the next uh, couple of months. It's not going to drag much longer. Oh, again, excellent points, and I thought that the, uh, the the points about the Shanghai Cooperation Organization and uh, Erdogan's uh, uh, commitment to to um, to trying to tease Putin into uh, inviting him into the Shanghai Five, etc., that you point out in your article, it's all very much to the point. So we have this this picture, but you have raised the specter of Yasin Al Qadi, and for those who don't know about Al Qadi, of course, he has been designated by the U.S. government itself as a suspected finan uh, financier of terrorism, and an al-Qaeda terrorist uh, um, f financial, you know, wizard or what have you. And of course, um, this brings 
in all sorts of different aspects, uh, including, of course, the FBI investigation into al Qaeda and the fact that the FBI and, and the United States government has known for years and years, as you point out, that uh, of his suspected links to uh, Erdogan. So why is it being brought out now when uh, Erdogan is falling from grace, obviously, as part of this bigger picture? But this does lead us into the question of the FBI and their own investigations into what's happening and Robert Wright and Operation Green Quest and all of these types of uh, connections. Let's talk a little bit about that. Sure. I mean, with al Qadi, the FBI had been investigating al Qadi since mid-1990s. And one of the main centers of al Qadi, Yasin al Qadi's operation, was in Chicago. Interestingly, Gladio B's center of operation also, and that was even before they switched to Gladio B, was Chicago. Because you and I covered that with Abdullah Chatlu, who was the most wanted man. And uh, he went to UK. I'm from UK. While he was still most wanted, he came to Chicago. He was given green cards. And he actually went to Beijing and from there to Turkestan, Xinjiang, Uyghuristan, a.k.a. it goes by three names. And he also went to Azerbaijan for the assassination plot back then when the father, Aliyev, was not uh, planning to fall into the Western camp. He was still in the Russian uh, Soviet camp. So uh, Chicago has always been the center. And as you mentioned, Robert Wright, John Vincent, it was that there was a big investigation of al Qadi and his terrorist networks and his terrorist, terrorist financing. Uh, financing, uh, financiering that he was uh, implementing from Chicago, from Saudi Arabia, from Turkey. And this was all also involved in Operation B Gladio. So it was not just some Al Qaeda in Afghanistan that had nothing to do with Al Qaeda. Most of these financing took place for Chechens. Okay, it happened during the Balkans. So Yasin Al Qaeda was one of our guys, CIA guys, with the Turkish network together having these terrorist-related uh, operations going on. But every time FBI wanted to go and snatch the guy, the State Department and the CIA would step in and they wouldn't let it happen. Then we had 9-11 taking place. And this was when we had Robert Wright coming out, talking about it and saying, they stopped the investigation. They being the United States government, we had one of the financiers, okay? And, and they didn't let us pursue him. They didn't let us capture him. So by this time, al Qadi was actually declared, even by the United States, that yes, he was in fact a financier. But even after he was declared, they gave him, the United States government, enough time to pack his stuff and go to Albania. Okay? It was like, oops, too late. We can't catch al Qadi. He is gone. So he continued his operation. Again, this is the Operation Gladio B with the Turkish operatives in Central Asia, in Caucasus, out of Albania. Then, of course, they dragged their foot. This is the United States. The State Department worldwide declared him as the financier of 9-11 and a wanted man. And they said, oh, he's in Albania, and we are going to request Albanians to turn him over. We have his address, everything, right? Well, they made sure it took about two weeks between the time they asked, requested Albania until he actually went to Turkey. And again, in Albania, he had Albanian passports. In Turkey, he was already a Turkish residence there. So he left Albania and U.S. said, oops, we couldn't, we couldn't catch him in Albania. He's not there any longer. <laughs> he is in Turkey. So the United States told Turkey, they said, you know, nod, nod, wink, wink. We want you to give this guy back. We want him here. He's a finance, one of the top financiers of 9-11. And we know that in Turkey, you don't even take a piss without the green light and permission from the United States. Turkey, for the first time ever, told the United States, we don't have extradition treaty with you. And he hasn't violated any Turkish laws. We are tough. We are a very tough nation. And we're not going to hand them over to you. And the United States said, oh, okay. And the case ended. Now, al Qadi, he owns, actually, he has ownership in several banks in, in Turkey, including in Cyprus. And meanwhile, he's going to Azerbaijan. And again, we covered this stuff with Zawahiri. You're looking at the same, same uh, operation team you're looking at. And he stayed there for years, okay? And meanwhile, he's also traveling globally, not only to Azerbaijan. He's going to London for his business matters. And he got some tough attorneys 
and and basically told the United Nations, you need to undeclare me as a terrorist. So the United Nations took him off the list. And U.S. basically covered up this whole thing. How could this guy in Turkey running these operations, which is for United States, for the CIA operations in Central Asia and Caucasus, and the issue was completely covered up. As you know, the media here in the U.S. never really covered al-Qaeda. You won't find more than a handful of articles. And suddenly, lo and behold, with uh, Erdogan, they leaked the fact that here are the pictures of Erdogan's sons getting into this 10 or $20 million deal with al-Qaeda, the al-Qaeda top financier. Here is the partnership between this member of uh, Erdogan family and al-Qaeda, who is al-Qaeda's top, fin <laughs> top financier. And, uh, and that's exactly what we are seeing. And another very interesting thing that is happening, some of these leaks are coming, of course, through Fethullah Gulen's network within the Turkish police, even to a certain degree within Turkish MIT. And of course, all, all of these are backed by the CIA. But interestingly, there are all these leaks that are happening that they are attributing to WikiLeaks. Now, WikiLeaks had this information for however many years, and it's very interesting that supposedly they are getting these from WikiLeaks and when it's really needed by Gulen and CIA network to bring down Erdogan. And I find that highly puzzling and very, very questionable as well, that how, how come are these leaks that were out there and now suddenly being rediscovered? Or are we talking about new WikiLeaks leaks that are being strategically timed and put out there? And if it's the latter, then I would be highly, uh, highly puzzled and uh, troubled, uh, to say the least. Absolutely. Well, just another interesting piece of, of this ongoing unfolding puzzle. And um, we, we've already talked about this to a certain extent, but perhaps we should just reiterate about how this, what's happening in Turkey right now is part of uh, a pattern that's played itself out in numerous different places um, in the past few years, Egypt, Libya, Syria. Um, do you see this as simply uh, another iteration of the exact same thing, or are we seeing something slightly different happening in Turkey this time around? Well, that's the empire's wish, but Turkey is not Egypt or Libya. You're looking at a totally different dynamics here in Turkey. And uh, uh, one of the things that I really find amazing is the, the, the level of awareness among the Turks, okay? Uh, number one, you don't have this two-party system that works really good for idiots in the United States. You have Democrats and Republicans, which makes it so easy to just take one and work another against another. In Turkey, you have multiple factions and parties. So it is much harder to be able to uh, basically hijack each one separately and also give crumbs to each party leader separately and say, we want all of you to come and join us in this takeover, which is the to totally the, the U.S. empire's wish, and do this. So that's one element that is totally different in Turkey. And as I said, the, the Turkish people are highly, highly aware, and they really pay close attention to the history. I mean, you're looking at a country, 1981, we had the military coup, and then we had this huge scandal in Susurluk in 1997, and it was all publicized that, you know, these were all elements that were being managed from the above. From the above, I don't mean God or Lord by the above. I mean here in the United States. So that is another big element. If you have a very, very educated uh, people there. So that is hard. And, uh, and the level of activism you see in Turkey, again, that is amazing. This is why when, when people are asking me on Twitter, you know, what's going to happen? So who are you rooting for? I'm saying I'm rooting for the Turkish people because Turkish people should determine what's going to happen with Erdogan, whether or not they want to replace him and who they want to replace him with. Because if that is the democracy in Turkey we are talking about, instead of letting the, the powers here dictate through their propaganda arms and channel, because they do have the media under control to a large extent in Turkey. And, and this is what they need to do. They need to keep their eyes open and also learn from Egypt, learn from Libya. And, and, uh, and I'm not saying it because I have like this pride of nationalistic pride as Turks, but 
you are not dealing with the same kind of people. Now, we may see some level of uh, violence there in Turkey, whether it is through some provocation coming from Gulen's element, or it's just simply Turkey, Turkish people saying, we have to take the matters in our own hand. Now, with Gulen movement, they know where these people are placed. For example, they know about Ihlas Holding. Guess who? Ihlas Holding is the one who has hired Mark Grossman, the guy who was on top of this Operation B, okay? So they know the individuals who are uh, the operatives of the Gulen CIA movement. And, and in Turkey, they won't have any problem of taking out some of these individuals. And I'm saying I'm not advocating violence, but, and as I said, this is what I expect to see. Turkey and I believe we are going to see. So it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be as easy as Egypt. It's not going to be as easy as Libya. And the other very important thing that Turkish people realize is, and it happened now to, to a certain degree, it played into the Turkish pride. They have been constantly humiliated by the you know EU because this notion kept floating in Turkey. If we want to succeed, we have to be part of the EU. Well, in the last few years, with the EU being bankrupt, you know, financially and politically, what is amazing is so many people in Europe, even from Germany, they are applying for jobs in Turkey, okay? So uh, they are seeing that, well, their economy has been stronger than EU. It was not a great thing. <laughs> it's a great thing that they didn't become part of the EU. And, and they see themselves as, as an independent nation that, you know, we can do well. And the, strategically speaking, Turkey has tremendous amount of power. They are the world's most strategic, important energy hub. Any pipeline you talk about, whether it's going to be through Azerbaijan, Shahtanis, or any of the pipelines, without Turkey, nothing can move. I mean, they can starve Europe. They can starve Europe of natural gas and oil. They realize this power. Maybe they don't have oil like Saudi Arabia or to a certain degree, you know, even Egypt. But they do have the the benefit, the advantage of the strategic positions. And that would give them the power to have a say, whether it is in dealing with Russia, whether it is with dealing with China, or whether it is dealing with the United States. And that brings up another thing with EU. I think many eyes in Turkey has become wide open. We don't need to be part of EU. You know, we want to be an independent nation. The next thing they should be looking hopefully is the cost of being part of NATO. You know, uh, it's, it's always in the past has been considered as, well, without NATO, who could protect us against the Soviet Union? This was during the Cold War. Well, we don't have the Soviet Union. And really, what benefit is NATO providing for the Turkish people? It has been nothing but cost. I mean, what happened with Syria, it is being part of NATO. It is being under the thumbs of the Western Empire. And as long as they continue that in Turkey, they will never be that independent nation that they take pride of being part of. And to do that, they need to reclaim the, the, the Turkishness, that an independent country that can determine its own destiny without the foreign outside influence and, and pressure. And that's what I'm hoping to see with Turkey. And that's what I'm rooting for, not for any party, not for Erdogan. I'm not a fan of Erdogan. I, I, am, I am a big enemy of Fethullah Gulen. I have been, and I have been saying it. I have been a lone voice here in the United States on that. But as far as what happens in Turkey, the Turkish people should be determinant of what happens from now on. And they are right now this very important strategic bottleneck, you know. And this is why I'm shivering. This is why I decided to write this article. And that is they have an opportunity here. You know, if the majority of them decide, fine, you know, maybe he engaged in all this corruption and things, which he did, Erdogan. But on the other hand, Maybe he has learned a lesson or two. Let's give him another chance. That's up to the Turkish people to decide. Or if to say we want some other party, we want some other uh, leader. Again, that's up to the Turkish people. And, and I'm hoping that the people here in the United States forget about what is being advertised and, and put out as propaganda by the CNN and NPR. And please read that article. Go through the links. You're looking at less than a year apart and see how these channels of, of the U.S. establishment is forming, shaping, 
creating uh, mindsets and opinions and how we view the outside world, whether it's Turkey or Syria or Egypt. Well, you raise such an important point there, and it's one that we keep making, but I think we have to keep stressing. It's that this is not just a binary choice. It's not Erdogan or Gulen. Of course, there are other options out there on the table. And as you say, the Turkish people are quite awake and aware to these different possibilities and alternatives and are uh, suspicious of official narratives all around. So uh, I have no doubt that they'll be engaging in this conversation and to some extent already are. And I notice that your article has certainly a, a uh, picked up the attention of a lot of uh, the Turkish community. Um, it raises the question of why you have not uh, appeared more in the Turkish media to talk about these issues in the past. Well, Turkish mainstream media in some ways not that different than the U.S. media. And in some ways, actually, they are worse because they have more freedom of playing with the facts, maybe, maybe more so than even here in the United States, which is appalling. Initially, when my case broke in 2002, 2003, for example, you know, I was interviewed by some of the top Turkish mainstream media newspaper. And, and of course, you know that things can get lost in translation, but certain things cannot be attributed to that. For example, they broke my case for years. They would put Sibel Edmonds, the CIA agent whistleblower. In fact, how could you FBI be translated to CIA? That's beyond me. But a lot of things that got so... Uh, twisted and then so and so much misinformation was placed in there that I said you know I, I'm not interested and I'm not going to engage get engaged in this kind of a game and in the past few years I have done not that I have been on demand by the US media but frequently I decline requests for interviews first of all I'm not interested in some two three minute sound bites in, in interviews uh, we want to find out what you think about Snowden and you have 48 seconds to tell me no, I'm not going to do that because whatever I say, they can take five words because that's what you have at 48 seconds and it can be totally taken out of context and it can be twisted. And now we have this medium called the internet. So I'm like, you know, through my partners, through our Boiling Frogs post, Corbett report, I can put all this information and people can come and they can listen to it and they can watch it. I don't need the mainstream media to have the platform to provide either some analysis or give some opinions. So same thing applies with Turkey. That's why I haven't done it and I'm not doing it. I will try to put this on the Twitter once the link is out and the Turkish people can go and if they're interested, they can listen to it. But another important thing I would like to do as part of this is usually these types of period, even though it's tough for Turkey or for any country when they're in this kind of a, a bottleneck and so much happening, there's so much chaos, it can go, I mean, it's a very stressful period some good can take place and can happen under these conditions. And I'm hoping that one of these main major goods ha would have to do with the truth. Because now with Erdogan, I am hoping that he's not as coward as Mubarak. And, and he won't take that coward ways out to say, fine, you know what, put me in jail or send me to UK, I'll settle and I'll zip up. He can make a lot of information public. He can actually expose a lot on Fethullah Gulen and, and, and the Operation B Gladio. He has all that information. And, and he will, even if he were to go down afterwards, he will go down as a hero. And he would be recognized as a hero. And he has an opportunity to do that. I know it's a really scary proposition because we know what happens to people who decide to talk, the leaders, you know. Nobody wants to be sodomized like Gaddafi and then be slashed, you know, into pieces. But he can, he has an opportunity here. And that would make him more popular with, with the Turkish people in the country than anything else. And maybe that would provide an opportunity to prove that real democracy can really hold and take place in Turkey. That's number one. Number two has to do with many people who were part of the Operation B, Gladio. They were part of the uh, movements before Gulen, before 1997. A lot of those generals, a lot of those people from MIT and from the military, they have been betrayed. They see themselves as betrayed by the United States because when the United States, they, they picked Plan B, this was when they said bye-bye to a lot of those people. And we know what happened with Ergenekon. We know that some of them are in jail and some of them are on their way to go to jail. And I know some of them are outside the, the country, outside Turkey. 
these people have a lot of documents. They have a lot of evidence that they can just leak, make it public, and show the Turkish people how they have been betrayed, how they are being betrayed by the powers. And, and this is the perfect opportunity for those former MIT members, for those former retired in exile Turkish military members to show what has been happening and to show what the real game is. I mean, that is if they consider themselves true nationalists, mean really Turkish, you know, because they, a lot of those people, they use the flag and they use the mustache. That's not being Turkish. If they really want to show how Turkish they are, they should show the Turkish people how the outside influence has been using them, has been shaping their politics, and let everything fall where they may. And this is, again, a great opportunity. Sometimes when you have wars between the you know, factions, then uh, that's when you start getting the truth. And maybe this will become a great moment of truth for Turkey and for our audience, uh, our, our, our American audience, who think all the stuff we are talking about here is about some internal Turkish politics. You are wrong. Because when, when or if and once or if they come out the truth, you are going to find a lot of answers of the real foreign policy practices and operations of the United States. You are going to find a lot of answers on 9-11. You're going to find a lot of answers not only on Al-Qaeda, but you're going to find a lot of answers on Zawahiri and so much more, which would be partly my case too. And so this is not internal politics of Turkey. And the Americans have as much reason to pay attention, to follow, to support the will of the Turkish people and to root for the truth to come out. It is going to have global implications if those, if they are real Turkish, if those generals and former MIT people decide to put out some of that operation manuals and documents because they have those documents and operation manuals. Uh, you know, Sibel, it, it doesn't happen very often that I get a chill up my spine when you know, having an interview, but that, that speech that you just made just did spend, send that chill up my spine because it's so true that that really, I mean, that the course of world history can change with uh, the release of certain bits of information that certain people out there really are sitting on and really could change the game altogether if they were simply to release it. So I certainly hope that message is taken to heart by, by anyone with that type of information that may happen upon this conversation or anyone who knows of people in that situation but at any rate until and unless that happens i think you're right we do have to support the will of the turkish people and the turkish people have to become um engaged and aware of what's going on to an even greater extent and i'm sure that they already are engaged in this to a large extent but it does raise the question i mean you raise the uh, the specter of the turkish media being even more controlled than the american msm and I just shake my head at that thought, but uh, but that does raise the question for people who are interested in what's happening in Turkey and the, these Turkish pol political issues. Where do they go for information on that that's not so biased? Well, there, there are some, just like you have been doing, there are some really, really good blog sites or the independent site. I mean, I don't know, I don't think we even call those anymore blog sites that of, of information sites that are out there. And I will try to make a list of, prepare a list of those and put it out there as a, as a separate article. As you can see, you know, with all the evil things that it comes with, Twitter can have some really, really major benefits. And I have been following a lot, and I have found out a lot of good links there through, through, uh, through Twitter. But also, one of the very important and interesting things about mainstream media, uh, including in the United States, mainly in the United States, being so under control, by following and reading that, you can find out a lot because you can actually see what the powers want to take place. For example, when you see in this case that Fethullah Gulen is not the party that is being poo-pooed here by the CNN and the NPR, and when you're seeing that it is a particular person, let's say Erdogan, that should tell something. It's almost like the reverse psychology. Sometimes you go to the corrupt sources to find the truth by saying what they are not saying or going and arriving at the opposite conclusion of what is taking place and what is happening. And uh, 
And there are some very good Turkish sites that are operating from other countries. I just started uh, communicating with this lady who's in Australia. And, and again, she's very independent. She's not following any particular, uh, particular um, uh, party in Turkey. And the other great advantage and benefit Turkey has is, unlike here in the United States, they haven't become too uh, inter internetized. Let me make up a word here. And, and this is why we see it. We saw it in the Taksim Square with Gezi Park, but you see it all over Turkey. Turkish people, by culture, by, by the way, you know, Tur Turks are, they are far more into human contacts, meaning we go out there, we get together, whether it's outside the university or it's some tea house over there. So um, that's another uh, great thing that Turkey has going. So it makes it much easier to organize, to network, and, and to do things. And, and that's one benefits, again, that, that Turkey, Turkey has. And the other thing I'm seeing that is gaining some momentum with, uh, with, with the, with the anti-Erdogan movement is, you know, with some of the corruption charges. And as I said, there's a lot, there are a lot of many, many beans that Erdogan could spill, but Erdogan himself also is putting out and, and is giving in his own way some clues and some tips to, to Turkish people. I mean, we had this news about some of these charity, Islamic charity organizations that they had a raid, you know, with the police force and they raided these recently and they're saying they have connection with Al-Qaeda and fine. Take it from there because first of all, all they're saying is these are the charities organizations. None of the mainstream media in Turkey or US are getting into the history and the context of these charity organizations if you start doing that in Turkey, here in the United States too, through internet and research, that's when you're going to get into the real truth because it's very hard for Gulen movement to expose these corruptions or these uh, shady financial uh, networks of, of, of Erdogan without exposing themselves. As I said, they were in the same bucket for all this time. Okay, that is Gulen and also um, uh, Erdogan. So it is a very uh, slippery slope there because when Gulen exposes a bunch of these networks that, that shows Erdogan has some shady dealings, as part of that, automatically they're exposing some of their own networks because they were doing it together. So take those you know pieces of information, go much deeper because the media likes the sound bite of it. Erdogan was connected to some terrorist financier period. You start digging in there. For example, when you're looking, uh, when you're looking at Al Qaeda's ownership of banks in Turkey, then you are going to see some really big names, Turkish politicians' names. And as I tell people, for example, you know, this is one. Maybe it sounds like an outside issue, but it's not. Then they say, "Well, why Putin is so silent?" When the FSB, Russians have so much information on Gladio Operation B, I tell them, well, Putin owns several bank accounts in Cyprus and has had those bank accounts since 2001. Now, Putin would not like to see that information being leaked by the Westerners because he will be finished in Russia. And Putin also needs to pacify the nationalist uh, faction in Russia. So yes, he has to be acting tough, but Putin cannot be too tough because Putin's assets, a lot of Putin's assets are in Turkey. They are actually in Cyprus banks. And I have said it repeatedly. And it again, it's not very difficult for people to take it from there because when you start looking at some of these banks in Cyprus, you're gonna come across a lot of uh, people, uh, big names big names, international and national. Uh, that's an exceptionally important subject right there, and that would get us into an entirely other conversation that I do want to have at some point. But for now, um, obviously, we have covered an awful lot of ground so far in this conversation. Is there any other points that you'd like to make before we wrap things up? Uh, I hope we will have some volunteers who may contact you through your website, uh, James who volunteer to translate and do so with integrity because as I said, you know, a lot of things can be lost in translation to translate this interview that you just conducted with me and also the article that I wrote into Turkish and put it out there. And again, here I have to, not because I'm trying to play humble, 
I, I haven't been able to enter Turkey since 2001. After my case became public here, unofficially, I became wanted in Turkey by certain faction because, you know, <laughs> uh, you know why that is. So I haven't been in Turkey. I have been cut off from my family. And where I have been, I haven't been really in touch with um, other than some, you know, uh, uh, written short communication pieces with some uh, Turkish people that I do trust. Other than that, I have been out of practice in, with Turkish, believe me or not. It used to be my first language. Farsi was my second language. English was my third language. And I don't know where it is right now, my Turkish. Uh, when it comes to a lot of things that has to do with policy, foreign policy, with politics, I would rather see someone who's a professional, up-to-date uh, translator to translate this interview and also translate our articles. And I would love to publish a translated version of it also there at Boiling Frog's Post and also provide a link for the translated version of this interview. Excellent. And of course, I would also mirror that and uh, put that up as an annotation on the YouTube uh, um, video of this as well. So um, lots of different ways that that translation can help. All right. Excellent. Well, we'll leave it there for now. Obviously, this is an ongoing story, so I'm sure we'll be back to cover it in various different ways in the future. But Sibel, thank you so much for your time today. And thank you, James. This video is brought to you by the subscribers of BoilingFrogsPost.com. For more information on this and other topics, please go to BoilingFrogsPost.com. For more information and commentary from James Corbett, please go to CorbettReport.com.